Good afternoon. Welcome to this talk, SC Linux Mandatory Access Control in Cockpit. I am TBR Prashad. I work with KPIT Technologies as a solution architect. I have 18 years of experience with 10 plus years of experience in the automotive industry. I have been part of production programs based on Linux and Android. I follow the AGL and the Alisa mailing mix very, very closely to understand the latest developments in the automotive industry. I play around with my Odroid C2 and my Dragon Board Ford NC in my free time. That's about myself and a few words about KPIT. We are experts in automotive. We have 7,000 plus employees, 51 patents, 25 innovation awards, millions of cars running our software. That speaks volumes about ourselves. Now let's look at the motivation for this talk. When we actually started working on our cockpit, we wanted our cockpit to actually support a mandatory access control or MAT. And we have selected SC Linux as the mandatory access control for our cockpit. So we have implemented SC Linux for our cockpit. We want to share the knowledge that we have gained as part of that implementation with the community. We also want to understand from the community if there are better ways to implement whatever we have implemented. We also want to understand from the community and Google if the solution, what we have, whatever we have implemented can be upstreamed or parts of it can be segregated and used in other automotive production programs. So this is definitely not a product pitch. Okay. Let's look at the agenda for today. As I mentioned earlier, we have selected SLNS as the mag for our cockpit. So the first item that we are going to look at is the SLNX labeling part in the cockpit. Then we will look at the policy that's implemented after the labeling is done. Then we will look at the checklist against which we review the policy that's been implemented. Then we will look at the questions. Okay. Let's try to understand the reference architecture for our container based e cockpit before we proceed further on the labeling part of it. As you see in this diagram, we are having a multi-core SOC on which we have a container based architecture for our cockpit. As you see, the IVI is running Android, the IVI is running Android and then we have another container called cluster for the cluster and the HUD. We have another container called Sysman, which is majorly responsible for handling the audio display and the early functions uh, corresponding to RVC and etc. So these are the major containers. We also have an ADAS container which is optional and the root namespace or the host namespace that we have in this, con in this approach is Android. Android is actually the root namespace on which the containers are actually running. Okay. We also have an ACLB controller which is providing us the CAN interface to, to the multi-core SOC to receive the vehicle data. So this is on a high level the architecture for our cockpit and I want to reiterate again Android is the root namespace for our cockpit and we have the Sysman cluster and ADAS as the containers. Okay. Now let's look at the primary goal that we started off with. Protect any rogue process from getting access to the vehicle and controlling it. As you see, as you see the architecture we have container based architecture and irrespective of whatever isolation techniques we have, we want to definitely protect any process from breaking out from the isolation techniques that we have, like you know, breaking out of the containers or breaking out of the process boundaries and getting into the root namespace or trying to play around with the vehicle. So even if it actually breaks out of the process or the container boundaries, the damage that it is going to do we will want to limit it. Okay, any process which is breaking out of it, its uh, you know barriers or boundaries, the damage that it's going to do is going to be limited. That's that's the primary goal that we started off with. Now let's look at some high-level requirements that we formulated from the primary goal. So the first requirement is files and process in the container shall have an SLinux label. So every process and every file in the container or the major uh, root file system will have an AC Linux label and a policy around that label will be done, will be created. That's, that's the requirement. Next requirement is processes accessing device nodes or interacting with the root namespace shall have a unique label. So this requirement is like this. 
all the processes in the container do not really get a unique label okay a majority of the processes share a single label processes only which require access to a device node or which are interacting or communicating with the root name space will only have a unique label again this is done in uh, to have a cap on the size of the policy as we if we start giving a unique label to each and every process running in the container and the interactions that are they are going to have the the policy the size of the policy is going to get bloated and definitely there is going to be some impact on the performance that's the reason processes accessing device nodes or processes interacting with the root name space shall only have a unique label to explain this further let's say as i showed you in the previous slide where in the reference architecture the sysman container has something called as an audio master or a display container display master so this display master is actually responsible for handling the drm part of it so the display master is the only process which is likely to access the display part of it no other process is allowed to access the display device nodes so that's the reason we will want to label the process display master and we will also want to give the policy access to the display device nodes only to the display master okay so the next requirement is load the policy from the root namespace only so we will want to definitely load the policy from the root namespace only we do not want to load the policy from any of the containers or anywhere else the policy has to set in the root namespace and it's just loaded from there okay then the next requirement is device node creation shall be done from the root namespace only we do not want the device node creation to be scattered across multiple places and uh, and then have some run into some issues we want the device nodes to be created from the root namespace the device nodes will be labeled from the root namespace and then bind mounted into the respective containers okay that way the access to the device nodes is con controlled okay the next requirement is domain transition to the container domain shall be restricted so processes that are spawned or you know uh, uh, that are spawned in the container uh, run with a unique domain label okay and that transition into that container domain is, is restricted no process can just directly go into the container domain okay there is a restriction in the policy that brings about transition restriction in the transitions uh, transitions into the container domain okay we also want to restrict execution from temp fs in containers uh the next requirement is we want to use the character device interface for <coughs> we want to use the character device interface for gpios we do not want to allow sysfs for gpio access in the containers and then last but not the least the major requirement that we have is the size and performance of cost of the policy should be within the permissible limits the size of the policy cannot go on increasing you know it cannot go on uh, it cannot go on increasing beyond a certain limit and that cannot go on impacting the performance of the system okay now these are the high level requirements that we started off when we started implementing now let's look at the approaches that we have evaluated the first approach as you see here is namespace support for sc linux apps let's look at the approach in detail in the next slide so as you see here in this slide we have each of the containers having sc linux having a separate namespace for sc linux fs so we have some out of three patches which allow sc linux fs to be uh, you know sc linux fs to be in a separate namespace you know you have a separate namespace support for sc linux fs that allows us to mount sc linux fs independently in each of the containers and then you can actually and then we can have a separate policy for each of the containers including the root namespace so sysman would have a separate policy that gets loaded from its slinux fs cluster would have a separate slinux policy that gets loaded into its slinux namespace okay so this is one of the approach that we have now let's look at the second approach use android build generated cells and file context to develop policy for container in yocto so this is like this android as you see in this diagram android generates couple of intermediate files compile uh, uh, common intermediate language files called sils uh, and these files can actually be moved to yocto 
and you can actually generate uh, you and we wanted to write the policy for the containers in sil okay and that will be placed in the container root fs the sil is placed in the container root fs the file contexts that are generated uh, are going to be used to label the container uh, files in the container okay and once you have the sil placed in the root fs of the container uh, as part of the android build uh, as part of the android boot process we are going to modify do modifications to the android source code to actually pick up the sils you know the cluster policy the container and as policy and all these sils from the container root fs and then android in its uh, system image has a sil compiler so all these sils are passed to the sil compiler and the policy is generated at boot time of the system okay this is the second approach that we have evaluated the third approach as you see is where we extend the root namespace or the ivi as it runs android we want to extend the ivi's slinux policy to the container that's the third approach that we have evaluated now let's look at the advantages and disadvantages of each of them as you see the namespace thing looks very good and promising but where it allows you to have a separate policy for each container that's good but the disadvantage the major disadvantage of it uh, as we see it is it's not upstream that is one of the major disadvantages again at the same time though you have a unique policy for each of the containers it, it becomes difficult to actually define a unified or an integrated behavior for the whole cockpit that's the biggest disadvantage that we see for this approach the second approach though it allows us to use uh, you know the container as independent okay the container policy is independent and reusable it's like tomorrow when i want to use the container uh, i can actually take this container and use in a different project where the container is uh, you know can uh, is already having the label supplied and everything looks good okay but to the downside of it it requires modifications to the aosp source code to pick up the you know cil from the container mount points that's number one the second one is again the policy is compiled every time the system boots up okay that's the second major disadvantage because that going to have some impact on the boot up time that we have the third is that the policy is not uni at a unified place it's like scattered across various places you have some part of the policy in the android build you have some part of the policy in the yocto side you have some policy you know so it's like it's scattered okay that's the major disadvantage the next disadvantage is that the paths in the file context are going to be related to the container it's not going to be related to the host so for me it becomes difficult to actually label certain things with respect to the host okay so that is one of the disadvantages that we look at okay now let's look at the third approach the advantages of the third approach that we have zeroed in on it's easy to develop and the policy and file context are not scattered okay these are the two major advantages that you have here again the on the downside of it you will need some offline effort that's needed to label the files in the containers root fs okay and again the containers policy and the containers file context are tied to the host okay you cannot have the container image uh, generated with a slinux label and you can just straight away use it in some other project okay so that is one of the major disadvantages but considering the ease and considering the way uh, the advantages that the third approach has we have selected the third third approach for our implementation so looking at the third approach in detail so as you see this figure so we have the te files for each of the containers okay each of the containers will have its own te files for the policy that it we want to develop for the containers and all these te files along with the system se policy te files and the se policy dirs you know the te files in the the vendor specific te files etc they are fed to the they are fed to the you know uh, linux compiler along with the security classes initial sets uh, the genfs context and the uh, you know port context all this is actually fed to the linux compiler and the, finally we have the sc policy that gets generated okay uh, similarly we have uh, the file context that are scattered across the system sc policy and the vendor part of it uh, and the board part of it all this is fed to the linux compiler and this is going to generate a file context.bin a unified file context.bin okay this is a in detail explanation of uh, the approach number 3 now let's look at how we are actually going to label the files in the container okay 
So as I mentioned earlier, we are using Yocto to, to churn out the container root FS images for us. So Yocto is going to churn out the container root FS and Android build as you see here is going to churn out the system dot image and the vendor images. Okay. So the container root FS that comes out of Yocto and the file context dot bin as we saw earlier that comes out of the Android build uh, is and uh, along with the container mount point is actually fed to a utility called as MK user image and you know, underscore MK to FS. This is a utility that is a byproduct of the Android build. It's a host utility that Android builds as part of its build system. So all these inputs are, you know, presented to this utility to generate a container root FS with SC Linux labels. So now we have a container root FS with SC Linux labels. And let me make a point here. Though this is actually going to label the files in process, uh, you know, files in the container for having the correct set of permissions for the files in the container, a config.fs for each of the mount points of the container has to be defined as part of the Android build. So please do note that you will have to define a config.fs for the container mount points and the permissions that you would want for the container mount points. Okay. Now we have a container root FS, which has got SC Linux labels applied to it. Okay. Now let's look at the policy around on how we went ahead and implemented the policy. So, so basically it's like what we have started with is once we init starts or spawns any of the containers units, we transit from uh, or the process, the init, uh, trans, uh, the init of the container gets assigned a label as container domain. Okay. And subsequently all the processes that are spawned out of, uh, spawned by the containers in it have the container domain as their label. Okay. And here we would want to make a recommendation that use that XCon if the containers in it is a symbolic link that makes it easier to implement. Okay. Instead of labeling the original and the symlink file, it's, it's easier to use the set XCon uh, if the init of the container is a symbolic link. As you see here, we have defined an attribute called container file type. At the same time, we have defined another attribute called as container domain. So all the files in the container have uh, are labeled as container file type and all the processes running out of the container will be having the attribute container domain set to them. Okay. So now we will, uh, now we have tried to actually develop a policy uh, around both the types container file type and container domain for our implementation. Then what we have done is we have, as mentioned in the requirements, we wanted to trans, uh, restrict type domain transition to the container domain. So as you see here, we have allowed container domain uh, to execute types of container file type, uh, open and read files of the container file type. Okay. And as you see here, except for init and container domain, no other domain is allowed to transit into the container domain. So that way, the only way that any process can actually transit into container domain is through init or container domain because container domain has to spawn uh, or execute processes in its, con in its context. So that's the reason we allow both init and container domain uh, to transit into container domain. No other domain is allowed to transit into container domain. Okay. This is the primary policy that we have come up for container file type and the container domain. Now let's look at one of the major problems that we had to solve. As I mentioned in the requirements, we have a requirement where we wanted uh, you know, the device nodes to be created only in the root namespace and labeled in the root namespace. Okay. And all the device nodes that are needed by the container are actually bind mounted into the containers, you know, when the containers are being launched. Okay. But as I said, Android, we are using, we are using Android as our root namespace and UMD is the domain, uh, is the daemon that's responsible for creating and labeling device nodes in Android. Okay. And the second stage of Android, second stage edit of Android spawns UMD and waits for UMD to actually create and finish creating and labeling the device nodes before it proceeds further. Okay. But as you see here in this figure, the containers are launched around 1.4, uh, you know, 1.4 seconds right from the boot up time. Okay. 
and after which you will be start set around 1.97 seconds from the start okay and then you can see here the dev node creation is done at 2.23 seconds and you can see that the cold boot which is like the time taken to create and label the device nodes took around 250 milliseconds okay so as you see this diagram it takes around 800 milliseconds after the containers are launched for UMD to actually create and label the device nodes. But as we have some stringent KPIs to meet uh, for the early audio, the early RVC, and a and, and couple of other uh, cluster required, uh, you know, cluster uh, key performance indicators uh, to meet, uh, this is this is something that we cannot do if the device nodes are created so late okay, at 2.2 millis 2.2 seconds right from the start. Okay, we have to have some solution to this problem. So the way we have implemented a solution to this problem is we have actually created or the device nodes needed by the containers are created in the first stage unit. Okay, and we have uh, labeled the device nodes in the container launcher as SLNX is already set up by the time. Okay. And once the device nodes are labeled, the uh, device nodes are bind mounted into the respective containers and then the containers are actually spawned. Okay. We cannot really wait for uh, the containers, uh, you know, the device nodes to be created by UND. Again, the, we have also evaluated a solution where we wait for UND to create the device nodes, notify us that the device nodes are completed, creation and the labeling of device nodes is created and then uh, we actually bind mount the device nodes into the containers and the containers are spawned. But again, as I said, uh, that, that's not really meeting the startup KPIs for us. Okay, So we, we want to understand from Google and the community if this can be actually upstreamed and if we can actually take some part of this implementation for upstreaming. Okay, Now let's look at how we have come up with the policy for binder. What, what's in store for us with binder and SE policy. So as we have multiple containers and we need we need to have some inter-container communication. We definitely evaluated different types of uh, IPC mechanisms or RPC mechanisms for uh, the container communication including Dbus. Okay, but as binder is upstream, we have chosen binder for inter-container communication. Okay. But as the containers are actually running in the vendor domain, uh, the root namespace, uh, which is like the IVI or the root namespace is Android. It cannot, uh, the Android policy, especially after that came into existence after Treble, does not allow IVI, which is running in the you know core domain to interact with uh, a vendor domain using binder. We have the policy only allows vendor binder or hardware binder uh, to be used between a core domain and a vendor domain. So as you see here, between Sysman and IVI, we use vendor binder and hardware binder. And for the other containers which are not are really interacting with the root namespace, we use vendor binder or sockets for IPC. Okay. We also have our own custom binder implementation uh, to meet certain requirements from the customers and vendors. So we are now actually working on a policy for the custom binder and the inter you know and the inter container communication that uses this contain uh, you know, custom binder implementation okay that's about binder and se policy let's look at the vehicle data access or the vehicle data network access okay so for the security of any of the systems especially with, with respect to infotainment or vehicle the major part is that you need to secure access to your vehicle network. Okay, so the network, to the the vehicle, the access to the vehicle network has to be really, really protected. So as you see in this diagram, the protection that we bring in is where we have Sysman having, uh, we have Sysman running uh, in a se separate network namespace. Okay, and the CAN0 interface which is a network interface is actually attached to the sysman container okay so so now the can interface is only visible to the sysman container no other container will have access to the can zero interface or the vehicle scan bus so as you see here cluster runs its own in its own network namespace adas runs in its own network namespace uh, ivr runs its own uh, you know ivr has its own network namespace with device nodes like 
WLAN zero or Ethernet or something like that. Okay, or the Bluetooth fan interface of it. Okay, but for the CAN interface is only attached to SysMAN and no other container has access to the CAN interface. Now, once we have attached CAN interface to SysMAN, we use CAN sockets to actually read the data from the vehicle's CAN bus. Okay, and we actually have a label for the CAN, uh, you know, for the processes access accessing the CAN sockets, and then there is a policy around these. Uh, you know, uh, around these processes which can access CAN sockets. No other process is allowed to transition, uh, you know, to do a domain transition into the the uh, demons accessing the CAN sockets. Okay, that's about that's about how we are actually protecting the vehicle network. We have two layers of isolation. One is the network namespace which is providing this isolation, and then next you have the higher level. Mandatory access control is in a providing us another layer of security to the vehicle network. Next, we have next major challenge that we uh, we had to face is the file execution policy. As you see here on the left side, the upstream Google's travels policy does not allow, except for a few handful of domains, to execute files. As you see here, app domain. Uh, I/O app prefetch D uh, and then Zygote web view Zygote. These are the only few domains which get uh, permission to execute certain files. But as we say, as as I explained earlier, the the container is actually running in the container domain, and the container domain would want to definitely execute files in its in its uh, namespace. Okay, so definitely we will need container domain to have the permission to execute files. So we had to modify the up, upstream policy to allow container domain, as shown here, to allow container domain to execute files. Again, uh, we will want to understand if this can be upstream or if there is, there is a better way to actually come up uh, with some policy which can be upstream. Okay. The next challenge that uh, we have is with respect to SysFi IPC. Okay. Uh, as you see here, the upstream policy does not allow of any domain to have access to SysFi IPC, okay? Uh, but again, as the containers that we have are uh, based on, uh, you know, they are just plain Linux containers. Uh, we'll need SysFi IPC for inter, uh, you know, inter-process communication, okay? So for that reason, we have to allow container domain to, you know, to be able to use the same force messages and the message queues, okay? So that's the reason we have modified the upstream policy from Android to allow uh, you know, container domain to access semaphores, messages, and message queues for you know, you know, the SysFi IPC. We have allowed container domain to access SysFi IPC. Okay. Again, we want to understand from Google if this can be upstreamed. Okay. Next, let's look at some of the challenges that we have. The first and major challenge that we have is container manager. So, as I mentioned, we have multiple containers, okay, and there has to be a container manager which is going to look after the health of each of the containers and respond the containers in case of any eventuality. Okay, the container manager has to be on top of all the containers and then take care of responding them in case of any eventuality. But how do we label the container managers as is it going to be in it or is it going to be a separate domain if it is a separate domain how does it transit to in it once the container manager actually gives control to in it of android okay so these are some of the challenges that we have and then once uh, we label the container manager as in it uh, the problem is android there are certain problems with android certification as android mandates that there has to be only one process with uh, the label in it. You cannot have multiple processes with the label in it. So this is one of the major challenges that we are stuck now with. Uh, we are trying to see how we can address this problem. If the community has some solutions, please write to us. Okay. The next major challenge that we have is with respect to logger. As you have seen earlier, the container is a pretty complex system. Uh, the e-cockpit is a pretty com uh, complex system with multiple containers. You have logs generated from the IVI, from the cluster, from Sysman, from Aras, from across all the cockpit logs are generated. Okay, so 
it's a challenge to actually define a policy for you know uh, for the process creating the log bundle and for the policy to actually give access to the storage where uh, you know to write the log bundle okay because let's say the p store the uh, the android side logs like the p store the nr traces the tombstones the dump states uh, and then you have different sets of logs in your cluster and this one so it's like it becomes a diff difficult problem to actually define a policy which can be uh, you know uh, unified for uh, for an integrated logger for the whole system so this is one more challenge that we are trying to address address okay now let's look at uh, the work in progress that we are trying to do now uh, we are trying to block execution from temp efficient containers that's something that uh, it's a work in progress right now again as i said uh, the only way that uh, any any process can transit into container domain is through init and container domain uh, but again any process running in the container domain if it writes to a file in temp efficient you know executes it it gets the container domain and then it it actually tries to you know use the container domain just to avoid that problem we are not allowing execution from container uh, from temp efficient containers uh, but temp efficient will have uh, to have the read write permissions but execution from temp efficient is going to be blocked from containers okay again uh, access to proc in the containers uh, is something that uh, we want to block uh, using the policy uh, after that we also want to use slint again this is something that uh, you know we have not yet started but we want to start using slint uh, to evaluate the policy that we have developed okay uh, last but not least we also want to actually create tools to measure the impact on performance okay because a lot of our customers are actually uh, our vendors or tier ones are actually asking us the uh, you know details about the impact on performance so we definitely want to create some tools to measure the impact on performance with the policy that we have created uh, we definitely are looking at uh, using ebpf to actually create some tools like that okay that's about the work in progress with that we are now moved to uh, the policy checklist we have done we have completed the policy implementation part of it let's try to look at some of the checklist items that we use to review the policy that's implemented the first uh, point in the checklist is never run any process with the label of init okay as i said there has to be just one process with the label of init and then that's it any process that's found out of init has to run in its own domain it cannot run in the domain of init uh, though the newer versions of android actually enforce this strictly uh, the versions at least still are do not enforce it strictly so the policy has to take care of it okay the next uh, checklist item that we have is never grant dac override permission no domain whatsoever will have dac override okay uh, what needs to be done is the file permissions or the process permissions have to be adjusted or we need to check uh, or the you know the, the file permissions and the file uh, the process permissions have to be checked but dac override cannot be given to any process okay that's that's uh, uh, you know checklist thing that we definitely religiously follow okay the next item that we have is we check if the regular expression rules are carefully written okay uh, because if the regular expressions are not carefully written the size of the policy gets bloated or there is definitely going to be an increase in the verification time so regular expressions whenever they are used that part of the policy is you know is reviewed properly to check if you know excessive permissive uh, you know excessive permissive access is granted or you know the policy is like getting bloated okay again uh, the next like uh, checklist item that we have is if the proper binder macros are used uh, you know the binder use vendor binder use or the hardware binder whether the proper binder item uh, you know macros are used again uh, this also checks the custom binder items that uh, you know the custom binder macros that we have for our custom binder dev node okay so all that is clearly reviewed with respect to binder access okay uh, so that you know we are not giving binder access to some process which does not really need it okay then again the next item that we have is the transition to 
seo or shell domains is restricted okay in production software we want to make sure that shell and transition to shell or seo domain is restricted okay next adb to the super user domain transition in production software is restricted okay this is one more thing that we ensure one of the other major important review item that we have is you might want some of these transitions to shell or su domains uh, you know as part of debugging so all those transitions that are needed for debugging are encapsulated in user debug or engineering they have to be encapsulated in this because if they are not encapsulated and if the developer forgets to remove them in the production build it, it becomes it leaves a security hole so as part of a review process we definitely ensure that any of such transitions which are put in place for uh, you know for you know accessing the shell or do you know su domains is actually encapsulated in the user debug or engineering macro okay so this has to be religiously followed otherwise that leaves a security hole in the system the next checklist item that we have is any container or any process that needs access to gpio has to use the character device interface it cannot use the csfs that's a requirement that i have mentioned earlier also okay that uh, that's a requirement that we religiously follow so again uh, if we have multiple gpios that are scattered across multiple ports okay the way that uh, the way this can be done is there is an uh, upstream implementation called as gpio aggregator where you can use the gpio aggregator to actually take the pins from uh, port a and port b what are they are the ports that you want to access and you have multiple pins scattered from port a and port b you can take the pins from the port a and port b and provide it to the gpio aggregator which creates a virtual port okay and that character device node is something that you can use okay the advantage that you get with using character device node is like you know you can let's say your container needs access to certain character uh, gpios the character device node uh, especially that's created out of the gpio aggregator can be attached to the container and then you're done that part of the gpio pins is not visible to anybody else and then once you have labeled the virtual character device that's that's generated out of the gpio aggregator you can have a label assigned to it and then a policy can be actually developed against that or a label that you have assigned to the virtual character device that's created out of the gpio aggregator okay that's the advantage that you get with using character device for gpios last checklist item that we use is create specific type for the object or objects uh, for the object or objects again to explain this in detail let's say i have multiple camera devices i have multiple camera devices and now i want to actually write a policy for the rear view camera process and time the rear view camera device node it becomes easier for me to develop the policy if i label the camera device using the if i label the rear view camera device as rvc camera device and i label the rvc process appropriately then it becomes easier for me to write a policy against that whereas if i label all the four camera devices say with the same label it becomes difficult for me to actually write a separate policy for each of them okay similarly for an ipod which is plugged into the system i will want the ipod to be labeled as ipod device then it becomes easier for me to actually write a policy for the ipod device in, in specific instead of writing a generic policy for all the usb devices that are connected okay so that that's the advantage that you get with defining a specific type for uh, you know for the device nodes or the files that are being accessed okay with that we end the guidelines part of it let's look at the conclusion so as you have seen we have added sc linux mandatory access control support for our puppet uh, and definitely we need the community the community to suggest if there are better solutions we also need uh, google to actually help us uh, understand how we can actually upstream these uh, changes and what's the best way to upstream these changes 
again we also want to understand from the open source community if certain parts of the policy can be extracted or you know segregated for use in any other linux based uh, you know automotive uh, production program we will definitely want to open source and upstream this and maintain this for any other production program uh, that uses linux and is linux with that i would want to close my talk i'll want to take questions thank you